right, Brother Lewis, thank you. Pastor, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Even all the way there in the back, this is a great RU crowd. You all have to show up Friday night, okay? And I promise I won't keep you longer than I do at RU, which is 9 p.m. Okay. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we'll read a few verses here and get started. Luke 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, this, these are the women, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bound out their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Uh, skip down for sake of time with me to verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linens laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all things, of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Let's have a word of prayer and get started. Father, thank you for this uh, this resurrection day, Lord. Another year, another week, Lord, that we celebrate uh, the rising of your Son from the grave, Lord, our, our hope of eternal resurrection ourselves. And I thank you for this uh, tremendous opportunity to speak to these folks. I thank you for the thoughts you've laid on my heart. I pray you help me to uh, convey them clearly, concisely, Lord, and that uh, we would all receive a blessing for having been here this morning. And most of all, Lord, that you would be glorified. And thank you for what you do here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We here in the year 2017 have something that the first disciples that came to the tomb that morning some 2,000 years ago didn't have. We have the complete word of God with us. Granted, they, they had Jesus living with them, ministering for three years, walking with him. They knew what he had said, but somehow when it came time to go to that, that first Easter morning, we call it, 2,000 years ago, they went to the tomb not really believing that what he had told them for three years was true. The women, the scriptures tell us, went to the tomb having prepared spices to anoint the body. They had not, it seems to me in reading scripture, they did not believe that they were expecting a third day literal bodily resurrection. We have the privilege of believing that today because what we, we can read the rest of the story, right? We have the rest of the Bible at our disposal. But the, the first disciples that first resurrection morning didn't know that. They were met with something they did not expect that first Easter, an empty tomb. And while that empty tomb eventually in, in their minds and hearts and as they came to understand it uh, meant victory because they knew what it represented as Jesus started to um, uh, meet with them in the hours and days that passed and, and we obviously know that ourselves uh, they needed as much faith in what he had told them the days and weeks and years leading up to that as we need today in the word of God to trust in what he had told us on that first resurrection morning, Jesus arose just like he said he would. The four Gospels give account of the women visiting the tomb on the first day of the week. Uh, having prepared the spices like we mentioned, they were expecting to find a body there that they had left three days prior. They were expecting to anoint that body. They expected Jesus to still be dead. But what they found was an empty tomb. And they, what they found when they, would, when they would come to understand what it meant was victory. 
uh, as we as we read down further into Luke chapter 24 and verse 15, it says, And it came to pass that while they communed, these are the, the Emmaus disciples, while they communed together and reasoned, for the Emmaus disciples, what they found that morning or heard about from the others was not what they were expecting either. But in verse 15, Luke goes on to say that as they did so, as they communed, as they reasoned, the Bible says, Jesus drew near and went with them. As we draw nigh to God, the Bible tells us, He will draw nigh to us. And as we reason, as we meditate on the Scriptures, not necessarily on what we see, not necessarily what the circumstances of our life are, are showing us, uh, and what our eyes might make us doubt, and what our hearts may make us doubt, if they will, and if they would have trusted in what Jesus had simply told them, how much peace they could have had when they first went to the tomb that morning. The word reasoned in the Bible, uh, this is kind of a devotion I had, I had been studying on some months ago, and it, it sort of fit with this when I noticed that that same word reason showed up in this in this gospel account in Luke 24. Sometimes it, that, that word is brought up when, um, when Jesus was speaking in his earthly ministry to the Pharisees, uh, and it says the Pharisees would go away and they would reason with themselves because they didn't understand what he was saying, they didn't want to believe in what he was saying. Uh, when, dis when the disciples would reason without any faith, Jesus would, would reprimand them, would rebuke them at times uh, for being slow to believe. In, in this passage further on than what we read, he calls them fools, slow to believe. Um, but God says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together. Um, the rest of that verse goes on to say, Though you say the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We have the promise of Almighty God, we have the promise of the Scriptures, that if we'll believe them, there's kind of the hinge pin, we've got to believe them, that we have the promise of God, that we are forgiven, that He is risen, that we can believe that here today, walking into uh, a church, a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church 2,000 years later, still preaching that same message that Jesus told His own disciples. The disciples communed and reasoned and knew not the Lord's presence alongside them when they walked down the road to Emmaus that day. In the garden, uh, we didn't read the, the, the gospel account in the book of John, but Mary Magdalene uh, knew not the Lord's presence uh, as she thought him to be the gardener, the scriptures tell us. Uh, sometimes we can get to a place in life and, and have great grief and great trial. Uh, we tend to forget the promises of God. Uh, and can only see the circumstances of life that surround us and that which we don't understand or can't comprehend. Those circumstances of life sometimes will blind us to the truth. Things that we know, things that we've, we've said we believe all of our lives, all of our Christian lives, things that the Bible gives us peace about, things we hear preached about and we can leave out of church on a Sunday morning encouraged by and then, and then a Monday morning circumstances arises and somehow we... we I'm just speaking for myself. Maybe, maybe all you are better Christians than me, but a lot of times on Monday morning, the circumstances that enter into my life, I have to struggle to try to remember the promises uh, that encourage my heart on Sunday morning. Uh, Jesus upbraided the disciples for not leaning on what they knew about the Holy Scriptures, the Law and the Prophets, and He expounded those to Him, and He'll do that if we ask Him to help us. If we, if we go to Him in prayer daily, if we have our devotions, and, and ask Him to uh, reveal Himself to us on a daily basis. We have to have that. Jesus was there all the time with them. He was with Mary in the garden. We sing the song, I Come to the Garden Alone, such a beautiful hymn. Uh, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the, Jesus was with them the whole time, standing by them, talking to them, reasoning with them, and they simply could not see it. I believe in part that may have just simply been for the agony, the confusion of soul that they had for not really understanding what was happening over those last three days since Jesus had been crucified. Over the last three years, seeing his earthly ministry, he had told them everything that would happen. He had told them everything that was to come, that would happen to him, and that what would happen in three days. And somehow they simply missed it. Uh, there's a song that we sing quite often in church, uh, one of the lines of which says, "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies." who can't explore his strange design. You know, when I got saved, uh, some things started to happen in my life that I didn't understand. Uh, I knew what salvation meant. I knew what it meant uh, 
for me. I knew what it would do for me, but I have no idea in the days and weeks and years that followed how that transformation would occur in my life. And there was a transformation that occurred here on that first resurrection morning. Jesus rose from the dead, and the disciples didn't really quite know how to, to deal with that at first. Again, we can, we can say all this about them, but we, we have the Holy Scriptures uh, to our benefit. Um, he had risen just like he said, but they could not see him yet. The Lord gave his disciples then, gives us today all we need to put our faith in, and he wants us to simply rely on his unfailing word and promises. It is ours only to believe and receive those promises, first for eternal life and salvation, and secondly, for a victorious life this side of eternity. We can have such a victorious, blessed, blessed hope in eternal life in believing in the risen Christ this morning. Uh, today and every Lord's Day, really every day of our lives, pictures of victory over death, hell, and the grave. I can't remember how long ago it was. I, I, I leave singing uh, for Sunday school here uh, in the morning services. And... Um, Brother Hector was teaching at the time, this goes back quite a few years, and he asked me to sing uh, the song Joy to the World, and it was July. And uh, when a preacher asked me to sing a particular, particular song, I usually try to do what he says, and um, brother, I remember Brother Case being in the, in the auditorium that week, it must have been right after 10 or something, and uh, boy, he just got full of the spirit listening to the Joy to the World be sung and uh, went into how we sing these songs, we, we, you know, just at certain times of years, just during certain seasons. But the truth of the matter is, joy to the world can and should be sung really every day of our lives. And the songs we sing that typically come out of the songbook around Easter time can be, sing, can be sung every single day of our lives. And we can go to this world, a lot of people will say, even secular folks in the world, Happy Easter. It's a greeting, uh, or He is risen. If you're uh, if you're familiar in Christian circles, or if you're a believer. But what would happen if if in the middle of July we went to work and just He is risen, praise the Lord, because every day of the year He is risen. Every day of, that we wake up and we're breathing, we recognize that it's because He is living that we have life. He is risen. We should proclaim that from the rooftops. Before the disciples could truly experience the power of His resurrection, they, and sometimes we, need to experience the faith-building exercise that only comes through the experience of an empty tomb, though. What they, and what we, what would they, I'm sorry, and what do we choose to believe? The choices are everything that God has told them and tells us through His Word, or what they could see. That first Easter morning, all they saw was an empty tomb, and immediately their thoughts went to one of the, the gospel accounts says the word perplexed. One of them says they reason and they commune with themselves. When the Bible clearly tells us we are to reason with God, we are to use the Holy Scriptures, we are to trust in what He tells us. Pastor, I don't have a watch with me. If I get near the, the end here, just kind of wave your hand or if somebody start going to the food line, I'll know to stop. <laughs> if I was there, I would probably have done the same thing that they did, and I know that because 2,000 years later, I do the same thing today. I forget the promises of God sometimes. I know He's alive and well, never interceding in my life, but I get my eyes on the circumstances and off of Him, off of my Savior. The key being the empty tomb, even when we see the empty tomb, and it, it makes us doubt, maybe for a moment, a split second, uh, hopefully not longer in our lives that we, we don't muse on that for longer than we need to. Uh, emptiness means victory. Uh, when I got saved, the Lord tried, not tried, well, for a while He tried, yeah. Uh, the Lord started emptying my life of some things that didn't need to be there, that shouldn't have been there. Um, and initially, for some of us, maybe that comes kind of as part of a slow process. Uh, it did for me, uh, but the Lord... Praise God was long suffering with me and gracious. And the peace, though, looking back at what He's taken from me, like that empty tomb, can bring victory in our lives. Uh, we don't have to look at those empty things, those things that the Lord has taken from us as great sacrifices on our part and 
why, Lord, did you make me give that up? It's a privilege to be able to, to give unto the Lord that which he asks us. It's a privilege to be able to be in obedience to him when he asks us to do something for him, whether we understand it or not. He allowed the disciples and allows us to have empty tomb experiences in life before we experience the joy of resurrection and to see what we will do with those experiences. He was there to pick them up and keep them from falling and from their faith faltering more than it had. In the end, their faith and ours will be uplifted and strengthened when we lean on him for underneath are his everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 33, 27. We have so much more strength through faith than we think we do at times of trials in our lives because we have him alive and well ever interceding for us. Right now, the Father is interceding. Jesus is interceding to the Father for us, for sinners, for this world. And all he wants is for them to put their faith in him, in a risen Christ that rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. Maybe you feel like you're facing an empty tomb of heartache here today, something in your life um, that is empty. Uh, remember what that empty tomb pictures. Emptiness means victory. He's not there anymore, but he's everywhere. He's in the heart of the believer through the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, I go away so that I can send you another comforter. And that Holy Spirit can be everywhere, where in Jesus' earthly ministry, he could only be in one place at a time. I don't particularly, particularly like the phrase or the word, I just feel like something. Perhaps you've heard people in the world say that. Um, when you're trying to determine how to go about a particular situation, a lot of people, I used to work with a person that would just always say, well, I feel like the direction to go is, is such and such. To feel is a gift we have as, as human beings, but it, I don't believe it's meant to be an inner conviction. It's, it's a tangible sensory act. It's something we can touch. And at times we need to do that. Um, the Bible talks about feeling as being a method for searching out after something that can't be seen as in the context of spiritual blindness or phys even physical blindness. Acts 17.27 says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. If happily they might feel after him, it says, though he be not far from every one of us. Well, if, if he's there, if he's next to us and not far from every one of us, and that's true even today in this room, why do we have to feel after him? It implies that there's a darkness clouding the eyes of unbelievers uh, and that they have to go around kind of groping, feeling after the truth. We can certainly feel after something knowing that it is there, but in personal trial we need to something more, and we have something more than feelings to work with, and we have the truth. We have the risen Lord and Savior, and that even when we can't feel Him, we have a firm foundation that cannot shake. We don't have to rely on past victories. We can have current victories, and we know we have a future victory in, in, our, in our risen Lord and in our promise, resurrection ourselves. We have promise after promise after promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And just as Mary and the disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced, he be not far from every one of us. It's a blessed, and as I wrote here in my notes, a sobering thought uh, that he's not far from every one of us in our lives, amen? He was right there all the time waiting to comfort them. The empty tomb, in closing here, caused a temporal emptiness in the heart of the disciples. They didn't know what to make of it. Maybe it was for a split second until they believed. Maybe it was uh, several more days, as in the case of Thomas, who doubted until the Lord reappeared to his disciples. Um, but if the tomb had been found to still contain the body of Jesus, that temporal emptiness would have been lifted for a season. They would have found what they were looking for that morning, and they would have anointed the body. But that temporal emptiness would have been lifted only to be, re only to be replaced by an eternity of emptiness. For we would still be all lost in our sins. We would have no hope of our resurrected Lord's a picture for a resurrected life ourselves. He presents us in his word with promises that if we will follow him and trust him, no matter what the outward circumstances seem to reveal, there will be blessings unspeakable and peace that will follow. I could never imagine what he was going to do, what he was going to take 
and do with my life when I decided to give him only that part of my life that I thought I could never live without. The disciples had to give up as part of God's divine plan the life of their friend, the life of their master, the life of their rabbi when he went to the cross, when he died, when he was crucified. Uh, and they, they were grieving over that. But the blessed assurance that came from the resurrected Lord was so much better than had they kept him around just to have his company. The disciples found an empty tomb 2,000 years ago and did not know at that moment in time what to make of it. They needed only to trust what they knew to be true about their Lord and that if they would trust him, even though what they could see was contrary to that, he would bless their lives with joy unspeakable. And then I just want to end with a line from a song. They who trust him wholly find him wholly true. Amen. I bless you this morning. Thank you, Brother Lewis. I have a question, though. I asked Sister Linda, she was going to amen her husband while he brought the devotion. I didn't hear one amen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she'd be going nuts over there. But Thank you, Brother Lewis. All right, let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll be uh, dismissing people by sections because we can't all go up one time. Okay, so uh, we're going to sit Let's bow our heads if we would. Jason McLaren, would you stand? Ask God's blessing on the meal today, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us, God. Send your son to die for us and to rise again for us, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. Bless us with our bodies, help us down the road to the resurrection Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Amen. Again, thank Brother Lewis for his thoughts this morning. Um, we are going to have church at 10.30, so at about a quarter after, we'll be letting you know, hey, it's time to get moving to church, okay? So we got plenty of time, so go through. Parents, please watch your